So, Professor Kenberry, in this regard, in your book entitled After Victory, which you published uh, in the early 2000, almost 10 years ago, uh, you, you focused on the construction of institutions and uh, institutional order in the aftermath of war. Uh, but, but what do you think, first of all, uh, why do you think that uh, the, the aftermath of war is a good time to examine the construction of uh, institutions or, or regimes dedicated to international peace as a way to begin our conversation? Well, it's, it's great to be here, and, and thanks so much, uh, Mark, for your uh, introduction and for uh, uh, providing this opportunity to talk about these big issues of order creation and order transformation. Um, I think that uh, the, uh, the, the moments where we can most clearly see states grappling with the problem of international order, that is to say, how we build relations between states and peoples across uh, great spaces. Uh, really, after wars, you see this in action, and you see the, the, the conversations and the efforts and the visions that are put forward clearly are at the level of what is the basic order, what are the basic foundations of relationships going to be. And it makes sense, because these are moments after the old order, in effect, has been destroyed. The war itself physically destroys the old order, but of course the war, in some sense, is itself a, rap a ratification of the failure of the old order. So it's not simply the physical destruction, but it's also the delegitimization of the old order. Something failed. Uh, you also have new winners and new losers. You have a new cast of characters who are thrust up or thrust down. You have uh, the, the states that have won the war have uh, no doubt, and certainly in the, the modern era, have uh, gone to war with not simply an effort to defeat the enemy, but to bring forward a new set of ideas. They, they have mobilized their societies, certainly democracies in the 20th century, the U.S., Britain, other countries have clearly um, uh, had war aims that they have uh, used uh, throughout the period of the, the war to mobilize their citizens and to suggest if you pay the price, if you suffer the costs of this war, we are going to bring forward on the other side of the war a better world for you and your, your family. So it's a, a, a true moment where, where you have, uh, a, 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 what you could call a constitutional moment, and I know we'll talk about constitutionalism, yeah. but it's a moment of, of where there are opportunities for real founding. Now, it's, it's also absolutely true that there are um, other ways, more incremental ways, uh, 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 that, that, uh, that states can build order, but these are the great moments, and I, you can see the, the clarity of the issues, the, the bright lines, the, the drama of order building is, is most, uh, most clearly visible at those moments. And, and I know that in order to, to write this book after victory, you have researched a lot historical cases, and so precisely, and we will talk about these historical cases a little bit later. But uh, in, in these historical say, uh, cases that you focused on, I mean, what are the issues and the questions in mind uh, in the minds of the thinkers and the decision makers at uh, at this uh, turning point as a way to rebuild and reconceive of uh, a new order? I mean, what are the, 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 the constraints and possibilities? What are the questions and issues that they have in mind? Right. Usually based on the, uh, the studies that you have done throughout history. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. And I, as I work through these great cases, 1648, 1713, 1815, uh, the 20th century cases, um, it, it struck me that these are moments when uh, states rise up, they've won a war, they are in a commanding position, if only momentarily, uh, states that have lost are momentarily, or their, their position is, is momentarily depressed. Uh, you have these moments uh, of opportunity. Uh, it, for me, it, it's, it's, it's in some sense a, a moment, uh, like the analogy might be a, 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 somebody who's had a, a windfall of, of assets. Uh, won the lottery, you have an abundance of power resources, of assets, to, and the question is how do you spend them? Do you spend them today or do you save them, do you invest them? Uh, so to some extent, for the powerful state, it's what kind of, uh, uh, of efforts do you want to make to put in, put in place an environment that will serve your interests over the long term? So you've got an opportunity, but the clock is ticking, you have to negotiate, even with those that you've defeated, certainly with your partners, in, in, in the, 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 the effort that, that got you to the conference table. Uh, 
but beyond that, uh, that's a kind of formal uh, uh, moment of, of how you, uh, a choice point where you may have to make decisions about using your power, twisting arms, getting what you want now versus putting in place rules and institutions, understandings with other states that may serve your interests in the out years. So there's a kind of temporal investment expenditure kind of dynamic, I think, that helped me kind of make sense of, of all these different cases. Beyond that, of course, there are more substantive questions. And the most important one is, is the security question. How did the war happen? How do we prevent it from happening again? Uh, what are the sources of violence and insecurity uh, in the years that we're going to follow this, this moment now of peace? Uh, so there's a, a question of, of uh, diagnosis of what the problem was. How did we get to this moment? Uh, during the 20th century, certainly uh, after World War II, there was a, a very strong economic uh, understanding of war. Uh, it g was traced back by allied leaders to, to the Depression, to uh, going off the gold standard, to the protectionist movement that followed the, the 1929. Um, so there were uh, um, uh, uh, arguments then and in earlier periods about what are the sources of insecurity. Uh, and I think that's a lot of it as well. I think there's another consideration that w works itself in, which is um, for powerful states, uh, this quote, question of how you create consent and legitimacy. Uh, uh, power alone, even before the 20th century, in earlier periods, before the democratic age, let's say, uh, how the... Uh, affairs of states are to be arrayed so that there is some measure of consent that will allow for stable rule. Uh, so powerful states are not all powerful, and the question of how uh, you negotiate uh, 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 agreements that will allow for some, uh, uh, some stability and uh, form of consent that will uh, make the order uh, durable. And then finally, I think the, the thing that's clearly at work at, at each of these junctures is is a, a question of, 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 of interest. What is the power, what is the powerful state? What kind of order does it want to so as to pursue its interests? So the U.S. wants an open order. It doesn't want an order built on zones and spheres and blocks uh, and and closed regions. So open, stable, legitimate. These are all kind of desiderata uh, 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 that uh, that come to, to into the heads of of decision makers at these these great turning points. Mm -hmm. So what, what you just said, John, I mean, brings uh, uh, three follow-up questions. First of all, so uh, in your in your research, you 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 find out that uh, uh, thinking about the future is always the occasion to also uh, reflect upon the past and see what went wrong. Uh, so, and then let's talk about this. And, and second question, you you mentioned that consent and legitimacy has always been. Uh, at the center of um, thinking about the future, and even this, uh, this even in, in pre-democratic times. So tell us a bit more about this. And thirdly, you, you mentioned that uh, at least in modern times, the U.S. has always wanted to have, uh, has always wanted an open order. Uh, why is it the case? So first of all, sure. uh, thinking about the future as a way. To, I mean, thinking about the past and the future. Yes, I, I think that uh, you see these um, reflections on the past. Uh, uh, there, 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 in, the, in 1919, for example, there was a huge uh, self-consciousness on the part of, of, of British diplomats and other diplomats and, and uh, Wilsonians uh, 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 as well uh, about uh, 1815. And, and of course, there were uh, works written, uh, uh, memos written for decision makers that, that, that saw this as a part of, a, of an ongoing historical process that goes back to the Westphalian founding. And, and so a kind of conversation across the ages, uh, uh, to some extent a, a realist conversation, a conversation among those who are commanding sovereign states. The state system is evolving. Norms are being brought forward. You're building on uh, the old norms, the founding norms, if you will, of self-determination and uh, 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 state sovereignty, non-discrimination, non-interference, and and over these uh, repeated post-war moments, there is a reflection on those norms, updating of them, and then of course you get this second wave of of updating uh, based on on liberal ideas that start with the Anglo period uh, of 
of free trade and trying to build a, this liberal order. And so late liberals talk about earlier liberals, and the liberal project becomes uh, a, a companion to the realist project of, of updating the Westphalian system. So there is this deep historical uh, uh, fluidity and uh, self-conscious uh, understanding, um, uh, not always leading to, uh, to better decisions, certainly, but, uh, but, but a sense that there is a, an ongoing process across the, 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 the decades and ages. I was going to ask, do you, you know, based once again on your research, do you, do you feel, do you think that uh, we, 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 we draw the, the right lessons from the past as a way to, be, to prepare better for the future? I think that uh, with, uh, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. I think that uh, there was a failure at, at Versailles to understand one of the, what diplomatic historians tell us is one of the great virtues of the Vienna Settlement of 1815. That was the the uh, rehabilitation of, of France and reintegration of France as a great power uh, in, the, in the Congress system, uh, the, the sense that a stable order has to be built on uh, a, a reduction of the grievances that uh, were in, incitements for war or that were the product of the war itself. So the treatment of the, 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 the vanquished uh, 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 was was it was done in a way in 1815, and the failure to understand that with with Germany, uh, the, the punitive peace, uh, the Carthaginian peace, as some have called it, of, of punitive peace that that created the the grievances that were part of, of course, the story of the interwar period and, and the return to war later on. Uh, I think that there were in 1945 there was clearly a a, a, a a sobered learning process that leaders such as FDR and Truman uh, had of that uh, of that Versailles moment and so you the, the talk of the United Nations there was a very self-conscious understanding not just of American leaders but of all the Western leaders who were part of the process of, of debating what a world body would look like after World War II uh, the, uh, the importance of building a, a, a great power exceptionalism in the Security Council, um, uh, of putting limits on what the, the world body could do, thereby creating more constituencies who would support it in the first place. Uh, a, 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 now, of course, there was the Cold War that, 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 that led to, a, to, a, to many decades where the UN could not play the role that was envisaged, but there, it was crafted with a very, very strong sense of, of learning from the past. Mm -hmm. and, and then you have the, uh, the, the notions of, of consent and legitimacy, and, and you just said and in, in the book you really uh, develop uh, quite a bit on this. You know, you, you tell us that uh, actually these two notions are at the core of a stable international order, even in, in pre-democratic times. So why is it that consent and legitimacy are so central to uh, a stable and, and just international order? Right. I think that... Uh, the, the, it, it's an important question, and you've written very uh, eloquently on it, and I uh, am still thinking about it. It's one of the great issues of, 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 of what, uh, what, what, what is the, the, um, the, the basis for stable rule and how power wielders are uh, faced with, with more complex uh, incentives and constraints than we often think. They've got material capabilities, they can march armies across borders, but they also realize that there are limits on that and that power is not all powerful. Um, I think it, 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 uh, it, it goes back to uh, 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 the, uh, the way in which uh, even uh, state leaders in pre-modern Europe began to think about in the absolutist age, began to realize that, uh, that the preservation of, a, of, a, of, a, of their power at the center of a state had to be defined in a way that would have some element of legitimacy. And that, that process uh, entailed uh, making bargains with, with capitalists, proto-capitalists, and other sectors of uh, emerging uh, European societies, and in effect, it's the paradox of power that was being manifest, namely that to hold on to power, you have to give up some power, or you have to embed it in some set of rules that l allow others to uh, be able to uh, make decisions uh, to work with you and to, to uh, provide a, or to grant a, a normative approbation to, 
to your, your position. Not entirely, it's a spectrum, and certainly uh, in, in the early modern period of Europe, it was never um, uh, fully realized, but there was a, in, but the imperative of, of, of trying to, uh, to create some measure of, of normative acceptance uh, through bargains with other power holders uh, was, was part of that, that great story of the rise of the modern state and the shift from absolutist to, to limited state and then, of course, to constitutional, limited state constitutionalism. And I think there is a, a fainter and much uh, rag, more ragged and less uh, eloquent story to tell about the same process at the international level. It's never a, a, a full, but there is there is that that dynamic, and you you see it, uh, I think, uh, uh, in these Western uh, uh, moments of, of order building. Yeah, and, and then you you also said that somehow uh, the U.S. is committed to to an international order which would be an open order. So yeah. so tell us a bit about this uh, characteristic of openness. Why is it so American, and why is it so important uh, for the U.S.? Yeah, I. My work is, is, is not a, a, a intellectual idealism. I, yeah. I, I am deeply grounded in notions of power, and, I, and while many people would say I'm a, a liberal internationalist, and I, uh, I certainly carry that flag into battle many times, <laughs> uh, I, 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 I gladly so, I, I, I think that you can't have theories of international relations and understandings of world order, the rise and decline of order, without a very deep uh, uh, commitment to keeping an eye on power and how it's yes. manifest and how it's transformed. I think that the United States is no different in, in the, that sense to other, the earlier great powers that rose up uh, 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 in the sense that it wants to use its power to, to, to serve its interests. Uh, uh, and then the question is, what are its interests? How do its interests define? What it, how is its power brought together with social purpose and with national interest? And I think each era and each state at each moment answers that question somewhat differently. But clearly the U.S. is rising up in the 20th century. It has these extraordinary opportunities. No other state in world history has had so many opportunities that the United States have had in the 20th century. Three opportunities, World War I aftermath, World War II aftermath, Cold War aftermath, and even today, first among equals in being able to set the agenda for order building. Um, uh, so the, the U.S. at each of those moments, at each of those moments, uh, has saw uh, its interests associated with with openness, with having access to other regions. Now, that's a story partly about capitalism and having a, a dominant economy that even in 1919 had passed to Germany and Britain and was well on its way. So it's partly uh, a story about open trade. Uh, it's also a liberal story about having access to each other's societies. Uh, uh, that 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 or stable order is one where where there's exchange where you can develop reciprocity diffuse reciprocity reciprocity ideally um, so I would say the u s grand strategy that in the most general terms across the twentieth century making its appearance at each of these post war moments was a grand strategy of creating an order that's open stable and friendly open i've just described it's partly a story about capitalism and markets. Stable, obviously, it's about trying to have an order that, that uh, lasts. You're trying to put down the tracks. You know that your power will not last forever. That's the investment story I was mentioning earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and friendly in the sense that uh, certainly after World War II and in the tw latter part of the 20th century, uh, always uh, um, looking out for potential uh, counter-hegemonic adversaries on the periphery of the Eurasian rimland that would have alternative order building projects that would, uh, uh, in effect, uh, be uh, non-open, hostile states. The big ones, of course, were the, the fascist states in World War II, the Cold War, it was the Soviet Union, but now it's the, you know, it's the Iran, it's the North Korea, it's countries that, that, are, that are truly hostile to this general framework. Mm -hmm. And that's a consistent theme, uh, open, friendly, and stable across mm -hmm. American order building thinking. You, you mentioned the commitment that any kind of big power has to its interest, and of course, uh, uh, while being you know committed to its own interest, it has also to think about what is required for the others to embrace uh, 
uh, this order that the big power is underwriting and the dilemma. So how do you balance the dilemmas between one's interest and the interest of others in terms of you know, building this international order? Yeah, I, I, I think that's the great question, and that's, that's a brilliant question that you've just asked. I, I, and I think that it, it's very much, we'll talk to, about it later, it's very much yes. at, the, at the center of American thinking today. But I, during this period of American preeminence in the 20th century, building orders, thinking about how to use its power, tying interest and power and social purpose all together, um, I, I think uh, the the... The logic that 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 was that allowed the U.S. to make its imprint so profoundly on the, the global system, particularly in the second half of the 20th century, was a kind of enlightened self-interest that building rules and institutions and partnerships and client states. It was just a a kind of hyperactive institution building that that was and institutions I, I think should be seen as forms of investment in building an institution you're saying you want a certain pattern of relations to persist into the future and so not ad hoc bargaining based on our relative power but but investing in, in rules and institutions I think there was a sense that that was good for the US but it was also uh, good for legitimating American power uh, for lengthening the and extending the, the influence both in uh, space and time of American influence broadly. So there was a kind of, uh, I think, a kind of uh, uh, genius to that to, to that logic. Now, it also pursued narrow interests, and it wanted those rules and institutions to privilege the U.S. The U.S. would have veto rights. It would want to be in, in uh, positions with, with states where it was a patron and states were clients. Uh, uh, certainly outside of the Western world in Asia and elsewhere, the Middle East. Um, and there is a darker side to this that uh, uh, I, I hasten to mention as part of the American project, which is often less celebrated, it certainly is there and outside of the West, um, uh, much more uh, crude power politics uh, in Latin America and the Middle East. Um, the role of, of oil led to the U.S., uh, uh, playing a much more uh, less enlightened, less liberal role in, in the Middle East with, with its client states. So it's a, it's a, a picture uh, that is, is not entirely 21st century liberal yes. constitutional. There is a lot of great power politics, but it's wrapped yes. in a certain kind of uh, American set of ideas that, that were very functional in the time period that uh, we see the U.S. acting. Uh, and so these rules and institutions would be part of what you call uh, uh, constitutional order at the international level as a way to handle these, uh, these dilemmas and, and, and manage them in a, in a, uh, in a, in a positive fashion. And, and so second question, John, how do you draw the line between the, 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 the dark side of uh, uh, American liberal order at the international level and uh, the bright side? I mean, how do you draw the line and how do you manage the drawing of the line over time, because this is a tough question. Yeah, yeah, I think I think so, and I, I uh, this is a, uh, where I, I think the the U.S. finds itself uh, very conflicted at each of these moments. Uh, I, I do think that there is a, uh, a a sense that that the 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 commitment to uh, open rule based international order, which, which is the basic def definition of a, of a liberal order, open and rule-based, was one that would serve a broader set of interests. In, in the 19th century, we called this thinking liberal imperialism, the sense that, that there's a non-zero-sum component to this modernization of the global system driven by lead states that are wealthy, that are capitalists, that have a lot of power, that they are not simply imperialists in the old sense, that they're not simply uh, imperialists in two ways. They're not, they're not imperialists in the sense that they are above the law, uh, that is to say they are actually operating inside of these institutions and are at least partially constrained by them. And secondly, uh, that, that the, the, the spoils of modernity, that is to say the fruits of market society at, on a global stage are, are spread widely. Uh, uh, and in these two features, that, that rules apply up and down, not just to the weak, but to the powerful, at least to some extent. Yes. And secondly, that the spoils of modernity are widely shared, 
are 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 part of the the, the light the the the, the, the light side uh, of yeah. trying to reconcile that project with what is uh, clearly a more dependent uh, 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 power political relationship with uh, with states that are not in the core. Yeah, but I mean, wouldn't you say that this kind of uh, constant oscillation that we find in the U.S. between uh, a humanistic approach? To, uh, to order and interest, and then one which is more imperialistic is not in fact specific to the U.S. in the Western context, but was to a certain extent also the dual identity at the core of modern European I mean, you know, uh, policies. Say more about that. Well, I mean, you know, uh, the, 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 the European history from the uh, 16th century all the way to the uh, 19th century when Europe was dominating the world was uh, of, of two faces, if you will. On the one hand, it was very much about humanism, you know, uh, you know, the rise of democratic values and, and you know, uh, all equal, universal and so on. And on the other hand, you know, imperialism developed and took its toll on the world at the time when Europe at the same time was really identifying and pushing forward these humanistic values. So right. somehow the, this kind of uh, uh, oscillation that the U.S. has between, uh, you know, um, uh, a liberal order open to others, bringing others in, and uh, imperialist policies is partly the legacy of the European modern project. Yes, absolutely. And, I, and there, it's, 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 in that sense, what you're saying is not unique to the, to the United States to struggle with these, the duality, so to yeah. speak, with... With the liberal mm -hmm. uh, uh, drama, it, it is a, a double-faced uh, 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 phenomenon, and I think that uh, the then the question really is what 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 are the dynamics? How does it change over time? And, and uh, w w it, this is a question really of history and uh, of whether there is whether the the, the whether you you should best see the American. Era, whether we're ending ending that era, I don't know. But whether we we should see the American era in the 20th century and and the early part of this century as primarily a story of a powerful state imposing its will on the on the world and gaining from that process, or whether we see this as as a, a slightly more uh, enlightened uh, a process where the U.S. is is it responding to incentives that, that Europeans did in earlier eras and states that will follow the United States will respond to, that you can't simply uh, uh, live in a world uh, that, that of, your, of your own making, that you have to negotiate, and it's in your interest. And, and this is where I, I strongly believe when we think about the, the rising states uh, uh, that uh, are outside of the West, the developing states that are becoming more powerful, uh, most importantly China, that the that we need to begin with power and interest, and we need to think about the kinds of incentives that these states will face that will not be unlike the incentives the United States face. Yes, you want to use your power to organize a system that will be most remunerative to you, but in the long term, that means uh, 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 trying to establish, as we said earlier, some modicum of legitimacy, some functionality to the order. Uh, and, and perhaps I could, I could make this point a little bit more emphatic by, by just making a, a basic point about, about international order. And this point is as follows, that any state, the United States now, China in the future, that any state that wishes to, to truly organize the system and have a disproportionate impact on how that system is organized needs three things. Uh, I would argue. One is power, a certain configuration of power, because you have to have resources and to, to engage in diplomacy, carrots and sticks, to make other states w feel they, they need to negotiate with you, they look to you, they know they may need you for protection, they may need you for market power. Secondly, uh, some level of legitimacy, that is to say the ideas you're peddling the ideas that you are putting forward as a powerful state for organizing the system must in some sense resonate with other states. That's the legit legitimacy point that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. If China is going to market ideas, uh, authoritarian ideas, they aren't going to travel widely. They, they, they have to be ideas that at, at some level are congruent with the what I'll call the polity principles of other states. Uh, and thirdly, some level of functionality. That is to say, the order must be doing something that states want it to do, solving problems 
facilitating collective action, grappling with the, the, the security problems that, that confront the world. And, and the, so we did have a convergence of power, legitimacy, and I think functionality during the, in, in the West and, and outside of the West during the second half of the 20th century. We, we, we had a trade system that, that brought in a, a golden era of, of growth, uh, not just in the West but beyond, and it has continued to redound outside of the West today. Rising states are, 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 are following a similar path as those that, that existed uh, in the West during the earlier post-war decades. Uh, and the, the notions of the, the very ideas of, of, of a certain level of democracy, of, of accountable government, um, have been embedded in the institutions that have been the governance institutions in this order as well. That's the, the legitimacy of the authority structure that has been built around the, the prevailing international order. So functionality, problem solving, uh, 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 and yes, you need powerful states that are patrons to that order. Yeah. So power, uh, legitimacy, legitimacy, and functionality. Yeah, and, and in fact, I think that these three themes are, are, are the very core of your latest book uh, uh, on uh, liberal order, and we're going to talk about the book yeah. in a minute. Before we, we, we move on to your last, latest book, I mean, uh, a question about the cases that you, uh, uh, that, that you are focusing on in, after victory. You know, you focus on the settlement of 1815, the settlement of 1919, the settlement of 1945 and post-Cold War era. So why the choice of these cases? And, and, and of course, all these cases are Western cases. So uh, your findings, would, have been, would they have been different had you focused on cases coming from, from other uh, you know, uh, parts of the world? Right. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's an important question. And, and these are Western cases, although World War II and even World War One, there is a there is a global dimension. They they were world wars, and the winners and losers were were spread out. But it was primarily a Western story, and um, I, I I think it's it's partly uh, a a it's partly a, um, a a a reflection of the fact that those order building moments did have global implications, and it's hard to. Great power wars created order, and the great power wars happened to occur in the West because that's where the great powers were. It's like, where do you rob a bank? Well, you rob a bank where the money is. I mean, you kind of have to uh, go where the 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 the, the great uh, upheavals are occurring that are that are in, in a kind of volcanic way uh, uh, rippling around the world. Uh, that's part of uh, the reason, um, but. I, I think it's, it's, it is a, a question, and, and there is a kind of logic to, as I mentioned earlier, the kind of unfolding of these two great order building projects that are now global and countries outside of the West are having to grapple with these projects in their fullness. The Westphalian project that has been going on for four or five hundred years and the liberal project for two hundred years, and those two uh, are the great uh, structural uh, unfolding uh, 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 dramas uh, uh, that, that um, whether east, west, north, or south, uh, states are grappling with. Yeah. And, and so, uh, after this book that you published uh, 10 years ago, you just published recently this new book uh, entitled Liberal uh, Leviathan, The Origins, Crisis, and Transformation of the American World Order. And I guess that in this book, you wanted to tackle the questions uh, which were left unanswered uh, in the previous one. So, uh, you, you mentioned earlier power, legitimacy, and functionality. So, are these the, the themes which are at the very core of this new book? And, uh, you know, what are the questions that you are trying to address in this new book? Well, um, the, the old book uh, was really uh, set me on a path of, of, of debate with, with many, many uh, scholars about order. And uh, mm -hmm. along the way, we, we had uh, the end of the Cold War and the, the, the new period of, of, of American role in the world. And, we, of course, we had the, the Bush administration, a very controversial foreign policy, uh, fissures between the U.S. and, and Europe, and uh, what, as I mentioned at the very in the preface of the book, uh, what what the big puzzle at the beginning of the process of writing this book was a puzzle about the Bush administration about what seemed to be less uh, less uh, emphatic, profound commitment to 
liberal internationalism to the kind of ideas about how the U.S. should behave in the world than previous uh, uh, presidents at crit similarly critical moments in, in the past. And part of that story is, of course, 1919, 1945, 1989, 90, when you had Bush uh, Sr. and Clinton, and before that you had uh, FDR, and before that you had Wilson, there was a certain accidental character to the fact that those particular leaders at those particular moments had ideas in their heads that had this kind of liberal uh, uh, character. There were other politicians then, as there are now, uh, who uh, were, uh, were either much more inclined to see the U.S. as, as, as a kind of state that needed to follow other Euro European imperial states in the in a imperial direction, others that were, saw the U.S. as uh, ultimately different, unique, and uh, needing to, to be a much more isolationist state. So there are, there are other histories that could have occurred, unfolded in the United States. So it's not predetermined in my theory. Uh, there's a lot of agency, a lot of choice, a lot of decision-making, forks in the road, and, and, and moments of decision. Um, but the, the, so the Bush administration uh, led me to be puzzled because the strong version of after victory was that the U.S. built this order and was so uh, well. It was such a, a a successful order for the United States that it would want to protect it. And and Bush after 9/11 looked to be much more of a of a, a revisionist kind of leader, and with a revisionist vision of the United States and the world that was much less, and this is important, respectful of the rules and institutions that I have uh, perhaps uh, gone out of the way to try to emphasize. Uh, and so why would, would the U.S. do this? Um, and, and, and the weak version of my argument in After Victory was, well, the United, there might be a leader that would want to pull the U.S. out of this liberal order if that's the way you want to describe what Bush was doing. Some might not describe him that way. I do. Um, if you try to do that, you'll be punished. And in some sense, that is the story that I tell of the Bush administration. That is to say, it didn't work. It was a, a unsustainable view of how the U.S. would operate in a post-9-11 world. So part of the story is puzzling out the Bush administration. But it's a much more deeper argument than that. And what really came out as I was doing my work was that the, it, the, the deeper transformation of the system was, was, was much more of doing more of the work of, of destabilizing the, the American order. And this is the, what we'll call the kind of movement toward the kind of post-Westphalian system. The, the liberal order in some sense was see, sowing the seeds of its own undoing or of its own crisis, if you will. The, the liberal order, as I suggest, was built on the foundations of a kind of Westphalian project. But in the, the 90s and certainly during the Bush period, there was a sense that Westphalian norms of sovereignty had kind of run their course, at least in terms of security and human rights. The, the, revolutions in, 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 in the, the global system that were unleashed by the liberal project were themselves undermining the, mm -hmm. the Westphalian safeguard structures of that liberal order. So it's a kind of a crisis the, of success in some sense. Yeah, the, the very tension uh, at the heart of the system, when, where, where, which had been very, very successful, I mean, a source of success in the past, where somehow, in your view, undermining the very stability and, 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 uh, of the system, right? That, that's correct. That, that the, the Bush administration was building a kind of post-Westphalian vision of America and the world. It would be above the order. It would be mm -hmm. famous West Point speech, 2002. The U.S. is a kind of... Uh, a, a state that would provide order, it would use its unipolar moment to, to, to safeguard the order. Other states would have to uh, acknowledge America's exceptionalism. It would be much less bound to rules and institutions. Uh, so there was this deeper shift in the system that was enabling the U.S. to, to think these, these, uh, these, these new thoughts about how the U.S. would operate in the world. And, and it, it, it didn't really work, but the the, the, the larger story is this problem not of, of the rise and decline of the, of the Bush revolution, if you will, but the, the way in which liberal order picks up its pieces and moves on in the aftermath. And again, uh, the, 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 the story is, is partly a story that, that is aimed at 
realists who are arguing that uh, that in the Clinton period and, and maybe today that the, the, the liberal internationalist order uh, uh, is is, is, is not sustainable, and what I'm suggesting is that it's, it's, it's succeeded all too well and that there need to be new bargains, new institutions, and the U.S. is going to have to play a different role in the 21st century, but that the underlying uh, constituencies in favor of an open rule-based order are growing, not declining. So it's a crisis, really, of America's position in the order which is traveling a kind of period of the rise and, shall we say, the slow decline of unipolarity. Mm -hmm. uh, the crisis of the American position as its power, the, the distribution of power changes. But uh, is, 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 there's, there's a drama there. But there, there is also a, a story of the surprising continuity and durability of the underlying principles that the U.S. embraced, but were not uniquely American. So, so in your view, the, 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 the ideals, the ideas, the values, the rules, the principles which have been at the core of the, of the U.S. Uh, order, international order are really not uh, in question. W what is uh, at stake is somehow the, uh, uh, the, 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 the redistribution of power uh, which somehow uh, forces us to rethink the whole situation. That's correct. That I, 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 I'm uh, placing my bets on a a a, 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 a 21st century where we will be, where the demands for rules and institutions for what we'll call a, a loosely liberal international order will will actually go up, not decline. Even though the states that will be at the center of those negotiations will be ones that were not there when uh, at the moment of creation the last time around. So, so, so John, you're arguing that, and that's, I guess, your, your, your thesis, you're arguing that uh, uh, for the years ahead we're going to have a, 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 a U.S. international order even though we will not have perhaps a, dominate, a dominating U.S. Yes, I, the, the, the U.S. position... Is it the possible? Order, think, sorry? Is it possible to have this? Well, that's, that's the big debate. I, I, think, I think it's... Uh, First of all, I, I want to say I don't think the U.S. is going away. The U.S. Yeah. is not going to exit yeah. the stage, and all of yeah. a sudden, uh, that the, the characters who are on stage will be all those except the United States. The U.S. will still be, even into well into the 21st century, will still be, uh, perhaps uh, if you count all the different assets and, and characteristics of power, uh, will still be there at the center. But I, and I, but I think it will. There are ways the U.S. can play its, its role that will enhance it, the probability that it will still be influential. But even if it's influential going forward, it will be less so than it's been in the past, because it's just inevitable that, that with, uh, with power, the U.S. is, what, 5% of the world's population. It's 30, uh, now less than 30% of world GNP. It, is, it, will, uh, it, will have, it, will, it will have to make space for other states. The, the power distribution is shifting from west to east, from north to south, even if you don't believe that China is going to dominate the 21st century, and I think there are real questions about what China can do, uh, there, will be a, 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 there will be other states that will be terribly important. But for me, that's a different question than saying what will the, the nature of the political formation that sits on top of that shifting power distribution. That, for me, everybody agrees the power distribution is shifting. What will be the nature of that political formation? Will it have liberal characteristics? And I, in my book, I'm making an argument why there are constituencies for wanting to keep that political formation liberal in character. Uh, and so you, you, you mentioned that we are in need of, of new bargains, new institutions. Uh, so, so my question would be, you know, what are these new bargains that we are in need of? What are these new institutions? And also, you, you mentioned this, uh, this rise of the South, the rise, this rise of the East. I mean, you know, for me, one of the key questions when it comes to these emerging powers, first of all, are they going to be able to sustain the economic growth? And second of all, are they going to be able to translate the economic power into a political power, yeah. Uh, yeah. because Absolutely. Japan did not succeed in, uh, yeah. on Absolutely. this account. So, so, so first, uh, first of all, John, uh, the new bargains, the new institutions. Yes, new bargains, new institutions. 
this this is what I'll say about this, and it's a story of rising states and the and the what they want and what the the existing international order will give them. It seems to me that, and we can we think of China, but it's also India, it's Brazil, it's other countries. But China, of course, is most most clearly at the center of this this question. There are there are three ways I'll, I'll argue that. China and other rising non-Western developing states will rub up against the, the, the existing uh, international order. One is a, the, the realist uh, uh, rub, the realist clash. This is really, you see this in the South China Sea. You see rising states like China wanting to use its growing power to push out, perhaps push out the United States and redistribute the power and the way in which uh, 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 the U.S. and China, its rival, uh, operate in, in, in Asia. So it's a struggle, it's an old struggle, it's a realist struggle. We've seen this over and over again across the centuries, rising and declining states. It's Paul Kennedy's book. It's the story of, of states struggling for relative gain in a world uh, of, of power and, 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 and uh, that's the story that's going to, going to go forward. The second clash point is what I'll say a struggle for authority. This is really a struggle for voice for privilege for rights in the existing order this is who what the, it's the G20 rather than the G7 it's the who's going to be on the security council can we reform the membership um, uh, who's going to be who's going to lead the IMF will it be a, an Asian uh, leader the next time around uh, so these are questions of, of redistribution redistrib redistribution of authority authority is is, is and that's clearly one of the stories going forward. The third clash point would be struggles over principles of order. So power struggles, authority struggles, and we'll call it principle struggles. Mm -hmm. What I'm suggesting is principle struggles are the least noticeable, the least salient of this. And um, yet, and yet the, quite important. Well, I'm listening very carefully to my Chinese friends about what they want and to some extent, they want to recapture some of that Westphalian system. They, they care very deeply about, about uh, sovereignty norms, even as China is, is giving way a little bit uh, as it engages in peacekeeping and as it talks about getting involved in anti-piracy on the African eastern coast and, and plays a little bit more of an interventionist role, acquiesces in humanitarian intervention. So there's, there's even movement with China on the sovereignty question. But it seems to me authority struggles and realist struggles over power are much more likely to be the story of the 21st century. I am not certain that there are new big ideas that, that, uh, that, that China, certainly India and Brazil are not. They're, they're deeply committed to democracy and the rule of law. I, I don't think there are, there are, China is really the, the question that, that, that many people are, are selling many books, uh, writing writing uh, books with the argument that, that China will bring with it an illiberal hegemonic project. And I am, my work is trying to uh, draw skepticism about that position. You know, uh, Mark I tend Jack, to agree with you. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and it goes back to, to, to what are the sources of support for the rule of law. And this mm -hmm. I go back, we can go back to what we were talking about earlier. I'm still fascinated with the rise of, of the rule of law in the West. And, and it's clear that, that a huge part of the story is rules are, emer are emerging not simply out of, the, out of liberal values, but out of the necessity by power holders to find institutions to protect their equities. Mm -hmm. It's about powerful leaders, again, the paradox of power, developing frameworks that, that will protect them, protect their, their assets, their, their equities. Uh, and, and this is not unique to, uh, to states that embrace Western values uh, about the individual. Uh, they, they are, they are uh, it's a more pragmatic, a more uh, interest-based uh, rather than value-based argument about the sources of commitment and constituencies for the rule of law. China will want those rules and institutions to protect itself uh, in a world where it has more to lose than it does uh, when it's uh, poorer and, 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 and more peripheral to the global system.
But but this this uh, emerging powers and that's the case for Brazil, India, uh, and China, of course. I mean, once again, you know, first of all, do you f do you feel that the economic crisis is going to continue and perhaps even more difficult? Although the first challenge is a really a serious one. Do you feel that they're going to be able to 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 translate the economic power into political power to find the right grammar, the right lexicon, if you will, to really uh, go from economic powers to political powers? Yeah. That's that's a great question. I'm 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 at the East West Center this summer, uh, working on that question and, and uh, really looking at how countries in Asia are responding to the rise of China. Mm -hmm. And you know, there is this curious feature of the uh, of 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 the uh, of East Asia where uh, increasingly states uh, in the region from North from South Korea, uh, Japan, uh, Philippines, Vietnam, uh, ASEAN countries certainly, Australia are all. Trading with China, China is their, is their chief economic partner. Uh, even Brazil in the in the Western Hemisphere, many many countries have China as their lead economic partner. Um, uh, more, uh, and the U.S. has lost that position uh, for for many countries. But these countries still uh, look to the U.S. for security. Yeah. So we have this kind of duality to two hierarchies: countries looking to the dragon for economics, looking for the eagle for security. And, and that is a very interesting and unusual, I think, uh, 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 regional and perhaps global uh, configuration. Um, and I think part of the reason why the U.S. retains a, a lot of influence and certainly security partnerships in Asia, but also around the world, is that it, it's a kind of offshore protector. It's, it, 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 it's a, uh, it's, it, it provides a, a fairly uh, inexpensive, uh, 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 relatively trouble-free kind of security protection, uh, uh, and it allows the countries to do lots of other things on their own, including trade with China. So I, I think that that if China is really going to, to 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 replace the United States, you'd have to start to see countries uh, flipping, so to speak, uh, reallocating their security partnerships to China. What we've seen in the last 18 months, two years in Asia, really is China trying to use some of its power, its new uh, uh, new uh, uh, capabilities, its new position in the region uh, in ways that have unsettled smaller, weaker states, uh, ASEAN states, questions of the South China Sea and, and China's, what some see as overbearing position uh, of, of, of claiming sovereignty and rights in that part of the part of the, the Southeast Asia, and uh, of course Japan and its island disputes, and South Korea have their own problems. And there's been a kind of strengthening of, of America's ties with with uh, with countries in the region, partly as a result of the uh, reaction to uh, to to China and worry about how China is going to use its new power. And that, and that, of course, the in the in the starkest form, that's the problem that diplomatic historians tell of post Bismarck Germany, the kind of problem of self-encirclement, mm -hmm. that you, your power uh, triggers backlash, it triggers insecurity. <clears throat> and so the challenge for China is to think about how it can take its proper place on the global stage without unsettling its neighbors. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> My own view is that that will lead China, if it wants to try to do that in a way that will create a, a benign environment for it. It will have to um, do what the United States did in some ways after World War II, which is mm -hmm. tie its power to an to, uh, order which is uh, uh, legitimate and functional. So China mm -hmm. will have to help solve problems, and it will have to articulate principles of order that, are, are, that resonate, that, that will elicit normative approbation by other states. And so China can't write its own ticket of global order. Even if it becomes, even if it replaces the United States as the world's largest economy, it's still going to be a developing uh, economy uh, per capita income. It's going to, if history is any guide, it's going to run into uh, problems. I mean, there are going to be bubbles and inflation problems, and there are going to be uh, 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 recessions. And so, China will, will come down to earth, so to speak, uh, economically. And so even, uh, so, so under those circumstances, it is going to really have to uh, uh, 
be uh, in the world and and negotiating and adjusting, and it's not going to be a, simply an order maker. It's going to be also an order taker. And again, to finally, to my final point would be that means it's going to have incentives to take from the two great order building projects uh, that we've been talking about, the Westphalian project of sovereignty and great powers and how we uh, develop mechanisms and norms of restraint, accommodation, and so forth, and the liberal project of how we get the rule of law to be organized in a way that, that will allow us to uh, engage in collective action and solve problems that are going to loom large in the 21st century. You know, in, in terms of emerging countries, you know, emerging powers, we always uh, put together India, South Africa, China, but I mean, it seems to me that the only really serious contender for the, for the future is China. I mean, I see India as having so many systemic problems that it's difficult to see how it could project really uh, in a forceful fashion at the global level. Yes, I agree with that. I think, and as a coalition, I, I think, China, India, Brazil, South Africa, Russia are yeah. are really odd, you know, really oddly put together. They have very yeah. different ideas, and Brazil is a is a, a country with its yeah. own experience. Uh, 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 so I, I I and beyond that, uh, China is very uh, has its vulnerabilities. We've been talking about. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's very energy dependent. Uh, uh, it it um, it 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 will not be able to, as the Soviet Union was able to envisage, a kind of self-contained or expanding Soviet world where it has junior partners and there's a kind of non-capitalist, uh, internally organized system. China is deeply uh, dependent on, on the world economy. And, uh, and yes, it can pursue opportunistic, some would say predatory kinds of state-to-state -state deals that seem to be uh, illiberal, but it can't build an order based on that those opportunistic and predatory ideas because that would really be a protectionist order that no one would win, and in, including yeah. China. So, so going back to this question of where, what principles of order that would be truly Chinese oriented that would be a successor set of principles are hard to identify. Yeah, yeah. Very hard to identify. Precisely when you, I, I know that you have a, a long standing interest in Asia, you spend a lot of time in Korea, in Japan, in, in China, you are now in Hawaii. I mean, when you talk to uh, your colleagues and friends in, uh, in, in China, I mean, uh, you know, do, do, do they tell you that there is a sense of uh, a clear roadmap for the future for, for China and the world, or, or do they tell you that, in fact, uh, even Chinese decision makers, Chinese ma uh, thinkers are themselves quite quite uh, uncertain how on uh, you know on how you know uh, on where china should go could go yeah i think uh, i i am struck by a couple things i'm struck by the fact that i think chinese elites still are are m more than anything worried about their domestic uh, yeah. system they're worried about stability they're, they they I, some i think there's been a certain kind of unnerving uh, uh, feature to the Arab uh, Arab Spring uh, uh, that uh, that is a sign uh, uh, in, the, in the kind of chill that that I think has been that set out uh, around uh, in, uh, in in universities and uh, on the, the sort of uh, the, the free flow of information and exchange in China has has, has reflected the sense of the state trying to reassert itself uh, out of a certain insecurity. Uh, we talked about the kind of economic uh, uh, vulnerability. Uh, uh, so I think there is still a, a kind of, uh, we aren't ready to rule, rule, rule the world. We just want to be, be stable and grow. And, and this 9% growth is, you know, just trying to keep this, this system going. It, it, it mm -hmm. mu it's a kind of uh, roller coaster ride, no doubt, and a sense of, of, of of uncharted territory and uncertainty about stability at home. I think that's a lot, a lot of what, what I pick up. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there are segments in, in China uh, who uh, that that do want to assert a kind of, in a realist way, as I was talking about, a kind of nationalism, a kind of uh, a Chinese, this kind of older conception of a kind of Sino hierarchy in Asia. Kind of we are, uh, 
we are at the center of Asia and the kind of sense of authority and power uh, and dominance that flows, the kind of re reconstitution of that, even as there's an ambivalence about that because there's a, an eagerness as well to embrace and use Western ideas about sovereignty and rule of law when it can, and, the, and the law of the sea and, and other uh, treaties that, that also are part of the toolkit that the Chinese are using to, to, to pursue foreign policy. But there, is a, there clearly is a, a nationalist uh, element that a uh, uh, hundred years of humiliation, a sense that China needs to have its, its, its position. That's partly a realist story, it's partly an authority story. Uh, my own sense is a lot of that can be accommodated uh, 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 and and should be that that uh, uh, that there's a there's, there's just a, 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 a that that China uh, should be welcomed that that China is all the problems of, of 21st century transnational problems of global warming of uh, 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 proliferation problems uh, health pandemics these are all issues that China has to be a player and. I, I think there, that we have to at least try to articulate a vision of a, of a future global order where they are a central player, uh, legitimate, integrated, uh, authoritative, proud, but also that, 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 there, are, uh, that there are rules and, and restraints that China, as other states, uh, will have to abide by. And, and so that negotiated... Uh, order is, is the one we have to shoot for, even though we realize that yeah. there are lots of other much uh, less uh, welcome outcomes that could, could come along the way. And, and, and what's the mood in, uh, in uh, Seoul and in, uh, in Tokyo uh, about these issues? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I think uh, Japan, I, I, I see in, in, in South Korea, I see a, a huge I see a, a really exciting uh, society and uh, politics, a, a democracy, uh, a, a thriving economy, uh, a sense in, in Korea, South Korea, a, a global Korea, a Korea that's not simply only concerned about the DMZ in North Korea, but, but played a greater role. It's, it's, it's going to be a, a, a more central player. Uh, it, it's hosted uh, the G20. It's going to host the, the next round of the the Obama-initiated uh, nuclear safety summit. So Korea is an example, like Brazil, of, of countries that have been regional players r rising up and playing uh, more of a role, hopefully putting more uh, assets uh, into the collective goods, uh, public goods provision. Japan is an uh, extraordinary country that I, I love and go to. Uh, my wife is Japanese. Uh, I, 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 there's a sadness, I think, about the, the failure of Japan to realize its, its potential. And as you said earlier, yeah. its economic ascent to the second largest economy in the world was not uh, accompanied by a political and geopolitical influence. And uh, I, I, it's, it's, it's a country that I still think uh, has and, and can play a role in articulating notions of human security and... Um, uh, 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 non-proliferation. Uh, it, it, it has been and should be a kind of uh, beacon of, of, of moral, uh, enlightened thinking about uh, disarmament, about a, a nuclear-free world. Uh, so I think the kind of soft power possibilities are still there for Japan, mm -hmm. but it's had a very difficult uh, a few, few uh, last uh, spring and obviously mm -hmm. last decade. No, no, absolutely. And perhaps, uh, John, as a way to end our conversation, if you were in a position to, to give advice to uh, uh, people in positions of power in Washington in terms of uh, the, the, the evolving world order, in terms of uh, handling uh, the uh, China-U.S. relationship, what would be the, the key points that you would want to put on the table for them to keep in mind and use as a, as, as a guidepost for the future? Yeah, I think that in some ways, my view, and this is really in the book, uh, Liberal Leviathan, that uh, the U.S. Um, in some sense has within its own power to make decisions about how it will, how influential it will be in the 21st century. And uh, I think I quote uh, uh, Pericles as recorded by Thucydides, uh, I worry less about the uh, strategies of my enemies than I do about my own mistakes. And, and the U.S.
could make mistakes that would lead it to uh, be horrified by the costs and the implications of these wars that it has fought after 9-11 and kind of come back and, and decided to play a more nationalist, more isolationist, not isolationist, but more yeah. traditional great power role, less liberal enlightened role. And I, I think what I am trying to, my advice is uh, the U.S. leaders should try to articulate that middle ground between, on the one hand, a, a neoconservative, the U.S. Uh, should try to stamp the world in its image uh, and uh, use its power in, in, in the kind of traditional ways that we've seen in the last uh, few uh, years. And the, the offshore balancing alternative that is gaining, uh, gaining some traction in some quarters, the U.S. pulling back from alliances, uh, uh, ceding uh, the responsibility for authority to Europe, to Asia, the U.S. kind of re returning not to isolationism but to a, a kind of offshore position. I, I think that is, that's as ill-advised as the neoconservative inter, uh, interventionist uh, alternative, but there is this older-style American liberal internationalism that's partly driven by leadership through institutions, through partnerships, through doing deals, through fostering good relations with client states, through paying for part of the public goods but looking for burden sharing. That It's a messy third way, um, and I think that the, that the constituency for that in the United States has, has weakened on the Republican side, and given the debt crisis on, on all sides, so to speak, uh, a weariness, the weary, the weary America, and uh, I think the leaders need to put forward a, a view that it's good for the United States to be involved and to... It, it, and it's, it's, it's done pretty well, that, and, and to help inform the American people that the United States is not simply a country like other countries, that it's a linchpin in a global order. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 yes, it wants to both pursue trade policy and security policy for its own interests, but it has, it has um, developed a system where other countries have looked to the United States and, yes, relied on the United States made investments in their future based on the premise that the United States is going to be there. The United States has been there partly because it has this enlightened sense of the, the global order, but also because it's good for the United States. The United States that has pulled back from Europe and Asia will be one where it will be much less of a master of its own future. Mm -hmm. the, the environment, the milieu in which it exists will be much more defined by others. So, it is a selfish but also, I think, an enlightened third way.